Well, folks are still joining us, but uh, I think uh, we'll get this uh, show on the road. Um, good afternoon and welcome to this session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will focus on University of Nebraska-Lincoln Professor Megra Jacobs' new book, After 100 Years, uh, 100 Winters in Search of Reconciliation on America's Stolen Lands. Congratulations, um, Professor Jacobs, and welcome to the Washington History Seminar. We are also very fortunate that we will, uh, we hope, have with us um, Professors Liza Black and Josh Reed, who will provide initial comments and launch our debate to both of you, or actually to Professor Reed. Warm welcome. We hope that uh, uh, Professor Black will join us momentarily. I'm Christian Osterman. I direct the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program, and I have the privilege to co-chair the seminar series with Eric Arneson of the National History Center and George Washington University. Today, Eric will introduce our speakers and moderate the discussion. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative effort of two organizations, the National History Center of the American Historical Association and the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program. Over the past decade, the seminar has served as a nonpartisan forum uh, for discussion of important new historical findings, insights, and publications. Behind the scenes, there are two individuals who helped produce this event, Rachel Wheatley for the National History Center and Peter Bierstecker for the Wilson Center. Our thanks to both of them. We'd like to acknowledge our supporters and we welcome your support on this day before um, Giving Tuesday. Uh, details on about how to support the seminar are available in the chat right now or simply go to our institutional websites. A couple of technical notes. Today's session will be recorded and will soon appear on our respective organizations websites. For the Q&A part of this webinar, you will have three options to participate. Our preferred option is that you use the raise hand function in the Zoom functionality. Uh, you'll be uh, put into a queue and then uh, prompted to unmute yourself once the moderator calls on you. You can also use the Q&A um, functionality um, to post your question and then Eric or I will um, uh, read uh, your comment or question, or you can email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org with a question or comment. Please do not use the chat function um, for your comments or questions. With that, I think uh, I'm ready to turn the Zoom room over to you, Eric. All yours. Thank you so much, Christian. Welcome, everyone. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce today's speaker. Margaret Jacobs is the Charles Mock Professor of History and the Director of the Center for Great Plains Studies at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. She's the author of three books published by the University of Nebraska Press, Engendered Encounters, Feminism and Public Culture, 1879 to 1934, published in 1999, White Mother to a Dark Race, Settler Colonialism, Maternalism, and the Removal of Indigenous Children in the American West and Australia, 1800 to 1940, published in 2009. The book received the Bancroft Prize the following year. And A Generation Removed, The Fostering and Adoption of Indigenous Children in the Post-War World, published in 2014. In 2017, she co-founded the Genoa Indian School Digital Reconciliation Project, and in 2018, Reconciliation Rising a multimedia project. And today she will be speaking about her most recent book, After 100 Winters, In Search of Reconciliation on America's Stolen Lands, published just last month by Princeton University Press. Margaret, the Zoom room is all yours. Thank you so much for having me today. I'm just really thrilled to be here. I do want to share with you that I am speaking from the homelands of the Pawnee, Ponca, Oto, Missouri, uh, Ka, um, who am I forgetting? Omaha, Dakota, Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapaho peoples, as well as those of the relocated Ho Chunk, uh, Sac and Fox, and Iowa peoples. And um, 
we can talk a little bit later about the uh, uh, the significance of land acknowledgements like the one I just made. Uh, I think they're part of what uh, the topic of this book is about. So I want to thank you, uh, the hosts, uh, Christian and Eric, especially, uh, but also the people behind the scenes who've set this up. And I especially want to thank Josh Reed and Liza Black for agreeing to comment today. And I really welcome all feedback and, and questions. Um, so I want to begin the talk by um, taking you uh, to Australia, of all places, in 2008. And in that year, uh, Kevin Rudd, the newly elected Prime Minister of Australia, delivered an important address before Parliament as his first official act. He said, we apologize for the removal of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families, their communities, and their country. For the pain, suffering, and hurt of these stolen generations, their descendants, and for their families left behind, we say sorry. Thousands of Australians, Indigenous as well as settlers, traveled to the capital and lined up outside Parliament House to watch the event. The apology also was broadcast live around the nation and most communities planned events to accompany it. The day of the apology, was momentous. Australians remember where they were that day, like many Americans recall where we were when we first heard of 9-11. A few months after this apology, in June 2008, Prime Minister Stephen Harper of Canada delivered an apology to the survivors of Canada's Indian residential schools. As in Australia, there was practically a national holiday so that Canadian citizens could view the apology at one of 30 major events across the nation. So not to be outdone and following suit, in 2009, President Barack Obama signed a Native American apology resolution into law. And I just wanna ask all of you out there in the, the uh, internet <laughs> land, which I can't see any of you, do you remember where you were when President Obama delivered his apology to Indigenous peoples of the United States? And maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh my gosh, am I having a big memory lapse here? What, where was I? You can be forgiven. The apology was buried in the 2010 Defense Appropriations Act. The White House did not invite the press or even any Native American representatives when the president signed us signed, signed the law. And the apology was very vague too. It quote, apologize on behalf of the United States to all native peoples for the many instances of violence, maltreatment and neglect of native peoples by citizens of the United States. So most of us don't know anything about this apology. We've never heard of it before. And needless to say, it has not brought any kind of healing to the United States. Instead, in the United States, we have mostly silence, ignorance, and denial when it comes to the abuses that Indigenous people have suffered. These apologies and ongoing truth and reconciliation activities in Canada and Australia were all occurring as I was researching and writing White Mother to a Dark Race and a Generation Removed, both about Indigenous child removal. I started this new book after 100 Winters in 2015, after attending the final ceremonies of the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission in Ottawa. I really wanted to explore the disparity in how Australia, Canada, and the United States were reckoning with their histories of Indigenous child removal and family separation. At that time, my book was called, Does the United States Need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? And I think there's always a danger in writing a, a book that you already know the answer to, right? <laughs> so this was going to be a book that looked at big national truth and reconciliation processes in Canada and Australia and the lack of action in the United States. But several things happened along the way as I was writing this book um, and took it in a totally different direction. So I started out the book with a very starry eyed view of what a Truth and Reconciliation Commission could do. And I thought that the United States should emulate Canada and Australia. 
then I started reading and interviewing many critics of reconciliation in Canada and Australia, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous. And I learned that redress efforts that occurred in those two nations have been a step in the right direction, and they have brought greater attention to settler colonial wrongs and Indigenous rights. But sadly, they have not brought a great deal of healing and satisfaction to Indigenous peoples. So this led me to ponder what had gone awry in these processes and what the United States might learn from this. Thus, the subtitle of this book is not called How to Achieve Reconciliation. It's called In Search of Reconciliation. And the central animating question in the book is what would truly bring healing and justice to Indigenous peoples in the United States for the historical abuses that they have suffered? And the second related question is how would this actually transform American society? So the second thing that happened as I was re working on this book is I decided early on that I wanted to interview uh, all sorts of people who were involved in truth and reconciliation efforts in regard to Indigenous peoples. And this included people at these very high levels. Uh, Murray Sinclair is one of the commissioners in the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, Mick Dodson, uh, who's one of the co-chairs of Australia's Stolen Generations Inquiry. Both of them are Indigenous attorneys. Um, but I also wanted to uh, interview a lot of different people who were involved at more grassroots local uh, community levels. So this included, for example, a central Nebraska white farm family who ended up returning some of their land to the Ponca people. The other decision about these interviews I made was instead of putting them away in, you know, my basement in a folder or in my hard drive, I decided I, want to make, I wanted to make these interviews public. And I also wanted to do them in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, not as a lone white settler scholar, but in partnership with a native uh, scholar or uh, journalist. So I teamed up with a local journalist here in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, Kevin Aberusk, who's a member of the Rosebud Lakota Nation. And we started this uh, project called Reconciliation Rising. And our point in doing this was to uh, showcase both indigenous and non-indigenous people who've been working together to both confront the harsh realities and harsh truths of uh, history, but also then to work toward reconciliation. And we started out doing a podcast. I think that's, I think every historian now has a podcast. <laughs> or we're, we're getting there, you know. Um, but then we, we quickly moved into also making films. We made an 11 minute film that just broadcast last April and we're, we're in the uh, throes of making an hour long documentary. And all of these interviews made me realize that there was a lot more going on in the United States than I had thought, but that few Americans are actually aware of this. We never hear about these uh, truth and reconciliation efforts. The other thing I learned was the people I was interviewing, especially at this grassroots level, really had a lot to teach all of us about, and they really had a lot of models for how this could be done that were very valuable, perhaps as valuable or more so than what you could learn from observing what was going on in Canada and Australia. The other thing that happened was a lot of the individuals I met really inspired me personally uh, to excavate my own background as a settler, as a white settler, and to get more personal in this book. And so the book became a very non-linear book it interweaves my personal experience with history uh, and more contemporary political events uh, in grappling with this history. So I wanna turn a little bit to talking about the structure of the book. That's usually kind of boring, but I hope it won't be in this case. I think it's just a, a way to kind of invite you into what this, what this book is meant to do. So in part one, or I should say, the. When I envisioned the book, I envisioned the first half as about truth 
and the second half about reconciliation. And then within that, there's a lot of variety. So in part one, it's called Our Founding Crimes. And this is where I get very personal and, and historical. I deeply explore the histories of the places where I've lived the longest as a settler. And these are Colorado, where I grew up, and Nebraska, where I've lived the last 18 years. And I do this in part to illustrate what it looks like for a settler to confront her truth uh, of where she uh, has lived all of her life and where she has settled. And I hope in doing this uh, that it will encourage other settlers to take this crucial first step to understand how land dispossession of indigenous people conferred benefits and advantages on them while disadvantaging and impoverishing indigenous people. Part two is about how the truth gets out and how, in this case, um, the events I talk about are mostly things that occurred in the 19th century. And then, uh, so this second part really deals with how 19th century white settlers responded when they first learned these truths. And I chronicle how um, they, uh, these white settlers created a movement that they called Friends of the Indian. And that at first they responded with a real concern for returning land to indigenous peoples, um, what we would might, might call land back today. Um, but quickly within, you know, just a few years, they moved from land restitution to uh, two other solutions that proved to be absolutely disastrous, allotment of Indian lands and boarding schools. And the allotment led to further dispossession of 90 million more acres of indigenous land. And both of these policies led to a great deal more violence and a great deal more trauma for indigenous peoples. Part three of the book, uh, where we're really getting into the second half, the reconciliation part, fast forwards to the late 20th century and early 21st centuries, as our counterparts, uh, Canada and Australia, reckon with indigenous child removal like that that occurred uh, to Indian boarding schools in the United States. And I look into the international legal instruments that the Australian Stolen Generations Inquiry and the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission used to try to bring some form of healing justice and reconciliation to their nations. So just a little teaser about this, uh, when I interviewed Mick Dodson, He's a Yawuru man who was one of the co-chairs of Australian Stolen Generations Inquiry. Um, he told me that he'd been influenced by the Van Boven Basiuni principles. And when he told me this, I kind of just nodded like I knew what those were because I didn't want to appear like I was so ignorant. <laughs> um, but later I learned that these were developed by two human rights lawyers and adopted by the UN General Assembly and in 2005 to guide the process of making redress for gross human rights abuses. And I don't think that Van Boven or Basiuni had in mind the abuses that indigenous peoples have suffered for over a hundred years when they drafted these uh, principles. Uh, but for Mick Dodson, they were helpful in trying to create a framework for the Stolen Generations Inquiry. And I'm happy to talk about this more later if any of you have any interest in that. Um, when Canada got around to doing its Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, from 2009 to 2015, it had a, another sort of tool uh, to use, a new international legal tool. And this was the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples that was adopted in 2017, after, or, I'm sorry, 2007, after 25 years of work. And the Canadian TRC, if you read its final uh, report, it uh, made 94 recommendations and they're linked very much to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and happy to return to that topic as well later on. So the final section of the book, part four, uh, gets back into the local, the grassroots and uh, into the personal. And this uh, chronicles uh, what happened to the Pawnee people who used to live 
in Nebraska, which was their homeland. It talks about how they were exiled from the state and after their exile, how their graves were dug up by lots of different people, including Boy Scouts. Um, and it chronicles how their ancestors ended up in the vaults of the Nebraska State Historical Society. And then it fast forwards to thinking and talking about what happened when the Pawnees came uh, in the late 1980s and asked uh, that their ancestors be returned to them so that they could be properly reburied. And this led to, um, led to a lot of conflict and division, but it also led to reconciliation in that um, some Nebraska landowners were inspired by this uh, conflict and debate to eventually return land to the Ponca people, or I'm sorry, the Pawnee people, who now have several parcels of land back in uh, Nebraska. So um, in the process of writing this book, because I mentioned it took a totally different turn, I learned a lot of different things than I ever expected. Um, one of these was that all settlers have benefited enormously from land dispossession, even if we or our ancestors were not involved in land dispossession at all. Even if we, we hadn't set foot in the United States until well after this dispossession had occurred. Um, and I feel that the US desperately needs to reckon with this uh, founding crime of land theft uh, and other wrongs committed against indigenous people if we want to build a truly pluralistic and democratic society. Um, another lesson for me is that this process of redress and truth and reconciliation or whatever we might want to call it really needs to be led by Indigenous peoples themselves. And they have many different opinions about how this should occur, or what should occur. They have diverse approaches, diverse perspectives. Um, and this process will, will work the best if it's carried out on many different fronts. One of the things I learned from uh, looking at the Friends of the Indian Movement of the 19th century uh, was that they really truly thought they knew what was best for uh, American Indians. And they moved from a meaningful gesture of land restitution to a paternalistic and damaging policies of Indian boarding schools and allotment. Another thing I learned in the process, um, I truly thought this book would focus on indigenous child removal, which I've worked on as a historian for over 20 years. But I ultimately came to believe that all efforts to bring healing and justice and reconciliation to indigenous peoples will fail unless they really deal with the founding crime of land dispossession. And um, another lesson learned is that um, the most meaningful truth and reconciliation efforts might not just be, or they might not be at the national level. They might be more at the grassroots and local level. And they might be at the level of the institutions that we're all part of, whether that's a university, a church, a corporation, um, a municipal government, a nonprofit organization, an environmental organization. Um, and so I, I started to think, well, why is this so? Why is this more meaningful? Why is reconciliation more meaningful when it occurs at these levels? And I think it's partly because I've always believed that settler colonialism, the process by which indigenous peoples lost uh, so much of their lands and their resources was always a very intimate occurrence. And it always happened to specific peoples on specific lands by specific peoples and uh, I learned from many of my interviews with Pawnee people, Ponca people, that um, they don't want just any old land returned to them. They want the land that was their home, that they have a spiritual connection to. And it's very meaningful when that land is returned by um, people who are settler descendants, uh, who have a historical connection to that land as well. And the other reason I felt that uh, these local grassroots truth and reconciliation efforts aren't just some sort of second best thing, uh, some consolation because we don't have a national truth and reconciliation process, but that they're really important because they're more 
apt to engage settlers in the process. And that's a really important part of any uh, movement toward truth and reconciliation. And finally, one of the things I think that a lot of people, uh, when they hear the subject of the, this book, they think, oh, you know, this is going to be a hard read. This is going to be something that beats me up, hits me over the head with a club, is, is something that is all about me as a white settler feeling shame and humiliation um, and guilt. But what was remarkable to me was in uh, the process of doing a lot of these interviews is that all the white settlers we interviewed who were truly and meaningful, meaningfully engaged in reconciliation, they didn't express that at all. They found this to be um, uh, a process that had led them to some of the deepest and most rewarding relationships of their lives. And their joy was really evident in these interviews. And I tried to convey some of the joy that came out of these processes. So one of the things I've learned, and I'll leave you with this, is that becoming accountable as, as a settler for the past uh, is a way, uh, becoming accountable for the past and the benefits it has conferred on us as settlers is actually an empowering and a an liberating experience. It's not uh, an onerous exercise in some sort of guilt and shame. So thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to hearing from Josh and Liza if she's able to join us. Um, and I uh, wanna thank you all for being here. And I'm really also eager to hear your questions and comments. Thank you so much. And thank you, Margaret. Before I introduce our first commentator, uh, let me simply remind you that uh, if you're in the audience and you wish to pose a question, you can get ready to do so now. You can post your question uh, in the Q&A function uh, on Zoom, or you can use the raise hand function, um, and we get to call on you uh, if you do that. Uh, that's our preferred way to hear you do the question yourself, um, as opposed to me translating it and reading it uh, uh, for you. Um, so you can start getting in the queue now uh, if you wish. Our first commentator this afternoon is Joshua Reed, a registered member of the Snohomish Indian Nation. He's an associate professor of American Indian Studies and the John Calhoun Smith Memorial Endowed Associate Professor of History at the University of Washington, where he also directs the Center for the Studies of the Pacific Northwest. He holds degrees from Yale University and the University of California, Davis, and is a three-time Ford Foundation Fellow. Yale University Press published his first book, The Sea is My Country, The Maritime World of the Macaque, in 2015, a book that has received awards and acknowledgments from the Organization of American Historians, the Society for Ethnohistory, the Western History Association, and the North American Society for Oceanic History. Along with Drs. Susan Sleeper-Smith and Jeff Osler, Joshua Reed has also co-edited Violence and Indigenous Communities, Confronting the Past and Engaging the Present, published by Northwestern in 2021. Josh, the Zoom screen is all yours. Great. Thank you very much, Eric. And Margaret, thank you for uh, you know, framing our discussion today and giving us the opportunity to read your book and uh, offer some preliminary thoughts here. Uh, so I would like to begin also with an acknowledgement that I am joining you all from the historical and contemporary lands of the Duwamish, Suquamish, and Muckleshoot nations and other Coast Salish peoples who call the waters and coastlines of the Salish Sea home. Now, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'd like to un unpack some of the terms of this acknowledgement because I think they resonate with much of what we're talking about today. Peoples. I use the plural form of this word when discussing indigenous peoples because it highlights the diversity of native North America. Many non-natives mistakenly assume that American Indians or First Nations peoples are all one monolithic culture group. And as Margaret points out, this is sometimes where these earlier reconciliation efforts go awry, looking for those sweeping one size fits all uh, type solution. Historic and contemporary. Too often, non-natives are comfortable studying or thinking about indigenous peoples and the safety of the past 
And they assume that native peoples, especially authentic ones, do not exist today. So they're surprised when tribal nations crop up and lay claims to certain lands and spaces or treaty rights and things like that. Lands and waters. For many indigenous peoples, especially those in the Pacific Northwest where I am from, both land and water were important components of their homes. They derived a rich living from the land, sea, rivers, and lakes, and many still depend on these spaces for their livelihoods today. And one of the items that kind of struck me in thinking about uh, Margaret's book is that so much of this is about land restoration. But what's at stake when we start to include um, aquatic spaces and marine spaces in that sense? Nations. This word speaks to the particular relationship that indigenous peoples have with the United States and Canada. These are tribal nations or first nations that usually have treaty relationships with the larger nation state. So many of the reconciliation efforts unsurprisingly point back to those treaties and treaty rights. Now I begin my comments today with this land acknowledgement. Um, for one reason, I've got a captive audience. So you all have to listen to me explain um, what's at stake in these land acknowledgements and why we use some of the terms that uh, we use with that. But I think that uh, those issues that I just mapped out peoples, historic and contemporary, lands and waters, nations, they all frame or should frame, should shape any efforts at reconciliation. And it also highlights what is at stake for today's Native nations in this important work. Now, I'd also like to kind of preface a bit of uh, my comments and frankly, my involvement today by admitting that I am not the audience for this book. Margaret is very clear about that. Like on page three, she says, Josh Reed, you're not the, no, I'm sorry. Um, she's very clear that this is for a settler audience. As she explains, truth and reconciliation helps settlers heal. Now I can see why she does this. She is trying to encourage or convince settlers to engage in truth and reconciliation. So it comes as no surprise that many of her examples highlight what settlers gain by engaging in apologies, supporting indigenous leaders and priorities, and in a few cases, giving back land. She urges settlers to reckon with the fact that they live on stolen land. As she notes, we cannot truly thrive until we face up to the past. Now, I appreciate much of what Margaret sets out to do in this book. I really like the local specificity of her examples. Uh, I think it was a, a wise move to center on Nebraska with a nice slice of Colorado in there because it showcases how settlers can do this type of work, especially since so many reconcili reconciliation efforts or events oftentimes seem to strive for some sweeping thing that fits everybody across an entire nation. But that's only if we're thinking about the frame of the nation state. What if we think about it from the frame of indigenous nations, the myriad indigenous nations here in just a place like the United States? As she argues, these transformative reconciliation efforts, their grassroots, small steps, based on listening to indigenous peoples might actually be the road to reconciliation. And I find that you know, kind of a, a provocative idea to really kind of think about because so often we're always striving for those structural fixes, um, you know, which is why she correctly notes that this potentially helps these transformative reconciliation efforts. They help to avoid the trap of the usual um, efforts to find those all encompassing solutions to the Indian problem. Now, by focusing on the local, she flips the standard narrative of always impoverished native peoples being dependent on settlers. We weren't always this way. We were made so through settler colonialism, nor should we necessarily always kind of frame ourselves as being poor and dependent. Uh, what I see in a lot of, uh, you know, kind of the truth part of her book is showing not just kind of how settler colonialism brought us to this point, but that stronger message of resilience of our communities. And so this I see as a key goal of the truth section of her book. I also appreciate how Margaret historicizes earlier moments of the possibilities of reconciliation, explaining how they went awry as soon as settlers quit listening to native peoples, 
instead falling back on protecting the system of settler colonialism. Similarly, she historicizes the long history of native nations, their efforts to connect reconciliation to sovereignty. This did not just emerge recently. Instead, native-led efforts at reconciliation were just one of many ways that indigenous people sought to protect their sovereignty, their homelands and waters, their relations with other than human peoples, and of course, their own families and communities. I especially appreciate that she signals that reconciliation is a process. And that's really kind of a, you know, embracing an indigenous perspective on this, not a one-off event, which is oftentimes the settler perspective. Kind of like, can't we just reconcile and be done with this and move on, say we're sorry and, you know, and just that's water under the bridge. You know, there's all those kinds of different, uh, uh, you know, metaphors and phrases that seek to explain this idea of moving on. But so much of what I see in the work that I do with contemporary Native nations today uh, looks at the restoration of relationships, whether it be through reconciliation, uh, which is a process of rebuilding or reestablishing or strengthening those relationships between particular tribal nations and particular settler communities. You know, I see this also with um, calls to honor the treaties. Um, or to even think critically about treaties, that these treaties aren't just for native peoples, they're for everyone. And these weren't just convenient little documents that were signed in say the mid 19th century for many of the types of communities and nations that I work with, but these are meant to establish ongoing relationships in perpetuity. Um, so I'll just kind of leave that treaty portion um, at, at that point. Uh, it's something we can certainly talk about later if we want to talk about uh, reestablishing or establishing relations. So indigenous-driven reconciliation efforts then strive to raise settler consciousness. This, the book does well, but they also seek to unsettle. So how can settlers accommodate those kinds of reconciliation efforts? There's no one size that fits all, as Margaret uh, points out. And so if they are properly centered, these reconciliation efforts on native nations, then there will be a diversity of approaches to reconciliation. There should be. So then my question, you know, kind of building off of that question, the initial question of how can settlers accommodate those kinds of reconciliation efforts, and more pointedly, what about indigenous reconciliation efforts that reject conciliation or really push the bounds on unsettling? I'm curious uh, to hear Margaret uh, at some point speak to that. So I'll seed our discussion uh, with that question. And Eric, if I'm following the directions correctly, I'm supposed to reserve a few questions for later, right? You can, um, if Margaret- I'll do that. Was respond now uh, to, to what you've just posed, that would be terrific. Yeah, yeah, I'll save those other questions. But once again, thank you very much for inviting me to engage. Um, curious to see how the discussion goes. Margaret? Thanks, I, I don't wanna take time away from Liza, uh, but I will just quickly uh, mention that, yes, I think that it's important, like what Josh has just mentioned is that of course, not all indigenous people embrace the concept of reconciliation. I mean, there's so much criticism of the concept. And I think in part that's because in Canada and Australia, the, the concept has been very much co-opted co by the state and co-opted in such a way that it it almost feels like, like another, it, that it's become like another policy, another assimilation type of effort, um, another way to just let's give Native people this forum to talk about what they've experienced and then let's move on. You know, let's let's apologize. There's, there were even reparations made. Let's make some reparations. And then finally, let's, maybe they'll stop talking. Maybe they'll stop, you know, bringing up all these claims. And um, so, I mean, there's, there's justifiable anger, there's justifiable uh, mistrust of these big processes. Um, and I think, you know, for some Indigenous people, they don't want to engage in this kind of 
even the grassroots reconciliation. Um, and so I think that that's a completely justifiable thing. Um, but I think it's still good for settlers to be unsettled. You know, uh, I was at an event once uh, of the National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition. And this is an organization that's run by and, and um, attracts uh, to its conferences almost entirely an indigenous um, audience. But there are a few people like me who, who go because we want to support and want to be involved in, in some way that we can contribute. And one of the speakers who herself as a settler made this really important point that for indigenous people, one of the major tasks uh, in dealing with this history is to try to heal. And it's, it's uh, maybe not to relive this trauma and to hear about this violence yet again, or to, uh, but it, it's really to find ways to move beyond that and to heal from it. But for non-Indigenous people, we actually need to hear the hard stuff. We need to be unsettled. And we, um, it may move from that to something more like what I described at the end of my presentation, where there is a movement towards something beyond that, that's more about establishing deep relationships and sustained and meaningful um, accountability. But I think we settlers do need to be prepared that we need to spend some time really thinking about the gravity of these things and what was done in our names as settlers. And um, so I don't, I don't have a good answer for you, Josh, but I agree that uh, it's, it's something that there's such a diversity of perspectives on this and there's um, such a diversity of actions. Um, but we settlers, I think, feel really strongly need to sort of, not just sort of, but we need to take accountability for this. Thank you. Josh, did you want to pose additional questions now or did, would you like to wait until later? I think I'll wait until later. I'd love to hear what Liza has to say. Terrific, thank you. Our next commentator this afternoon is Liza Black, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and an assistant professor of history and Native American and indigenous studies at Indiana University. She's currently a visiting scholar at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her first book, Picturing Indians, Native Americans in Film, 1941 to 1960, was published by the University of Nebraska Press in 2020. And she is currently working on a second book, a transnational history entitled, How to Get Away with Murder, A History of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Liza, the Zoom screen, all yours. Thank you so much. OCO, I am speaking to you from the unceded lands of the Chumash Nation, occupied by settlers citing the unratified treaty of June 10th, 1851. Thank you so much for this, uh, this opportunity to be here. It's really an honor to be speaking about Margaret's work and um, I really appreciate Margaret's comments and, and Josh's comments. So thank you so much for this opportunity and this invitation. And speaking of land acknowledgements, you know, my perspective really on this particular book is that this is a land acknowledgement, that this is what land acknowledgements should be in that they should be ongoing. It should be, they should be about your relationship with the nations on whose land you occupy. And so not only has Margaret done that in terms of thinking about the land she occupies as a scholar, but also the land she occupied as a child and, and you know, young woman. Um, so, so that's really what this book does so well. Now I'm going to do something really different from what Josh did. I gave this book a very, very close read. I even made a map of your book. If you can see all of my notes. Um, so, so I'm going to sort of give a really close reading of your book. So after 100 winters and search of reconciliation on America's stolen lands, weaves together the past and present, history and autobiography, tragedy and hope. Part one, our founding crimes uses titles, blood, eyes, spirit, bellies, tongues, to tell the histories of Colorado, Utah, and Nebraska. Blood tells of Indian massacres, especially the Sand Creek massacre in Colorado, today being the 157th anniversary of this particular massacre. 
in eyes we learn of the bear creek massacre in utah and the two white men soul and kramer who witnessed and documented this horror in spirits we learn of the struggles over who controls the narrative of sand sand creek and whether it is to be called a battle or a massacre bellies tells the history of poncas in nebraska who were assaulted and removed by settlers and the settler state doing so under the guise of legality, only to be turned into starving refugees who, quote, felt a constant ache deep in their bellies. Tongues documents the lectures given by Standing Bear and La Flesh to persuade Americans to allow Poncas to remain on their homelands in Nebraska. Part two, promoting reconciliation in the 19th century features Rousing the Conscience, a documentation of settlers who advocated for Indian people. In Friends of the Indian, Jacobs suggests how this organization's fundamental flaws led to their deadly embrace of the boarding school policy and allotment. The boarding school chapter brings together everything we know about the starvation, abuse, death, family separation, and intergenerational trauma engendered by what we might, might better be called indoctrination camps. Part three, searching for truth and reconciliation in the 20th century, 21st century, excuse me, gives us America's stolen generations, a chapter looking at truth and reconciliation processes in Canada and Australia and the non-governmental process in the United States. In drawing out the contrast between the U.S. and the rest of the world, Jacobs notes that Zakala Saw got fired while teaching at Carlisle for her outspokenness. She also documents how John Collier put an end to many boarding schools for Native children, yet public schools took over that work, carrying on the legacy in their unsafe school buildings and their incompetent curricula. Today, the most famous of the American camps for Native children, which we call boarding schools, Carlisle, is a war college with limited access to the public because of it being a military campus. Survivors most want access to the school's cemetery where they can visit the graves of the children. Yet, as Jacobs shows, Many of the children who died at Carlisle were secretly absconded from Carlisle and buried in random graves elsewhere. As boarding school policy phased out, adoption agencies and social workers took up the American impulse of separating Indian children from their parents, which led to Indian women demanding the Indian Child Welfare Act to protect their families from the arm of governmental and private agencies. Jacobs notes the ongoing move towards separating Native children and parents in that New Mexico hospitals separated Native mothers, yet no one else, from their newborns because of COVID-19 for extended periods of time. The chapter, The Hardest Word, gives us an understanding of the word sorry in reconciliation efforts in Canada, Australia, and the U.S., and where the mouth is informs the reader of the reparations aspect of reconciliation. Where conservative administrations roundly refused reparations in Australia, Canada created a complex scoring system of suffering and excluded Métis victims. Jacobs reminds us that when settler governments create trust accounts on behalf of Native people, the money mysteriously disappears highlighting the need to transfer funds directly into the individual and private hands of victims. Jacobs sees a disingenuousness at work in reconciliation efforts as reparations have only been made after the threat of a class action lawsuit. Lastly, Jacobs contrasts the bewildering and lengthy path to reparations in Australia and Canada in comparison to the swift payout to 9-11 survivors of over $1 million each. Lastly, Jacob reminds us that reconciliation and reparations are rendered questionable when Indian child removal continues today. In her last part, part four, Ground Swell for Reconciliation, she returns to this use of bodies as titles using skulls, bones, hands, and hearts 
to finish out after 100 winters. Skulls tells the gruesome and horrible history of settlers stealing Pawnee bodies. Smartly, she begins this chapter with the story of a white American soldier who had been misidentified and buried incorrectly, being repatriated on her domestic flight where she witnessed tremendous respect for the process. Jacobs then contrasts the history of violence toward Native peoples in Nebraska, resulting in many Pawnee deaths, followed by the U.S. Army and anthropologists stealing Pawnee bodies. Nebraska settlers built sporting and tourism events around stealing Pawnee bodies from the land. Jacobs proves that these thieves knew what they were doing, and they knew that it was deeply offensive to Pawnee people. She keeps a close and steady eye on Pawnee Nation and the state of Nebraska, but doesn't hesitate to tell us how the Smithsonian displayed the crania of Native people right at the entrance to their museum in 1970, or that Dr. Mayo of the Mayo Clinic stole the corpse of one of the men executed as part of the Dakota 38. Bones tells the reader of Pawnee Nation's century-long effort at getting their ancestors' return, remains returned from the Nebraska Historical Society an organization who put up refusal after refusal in response to Pawnee Nation. Someone at University of Nebraska even are incinerated some bones of ancestors instead of repatriating them. In Hands, we learn of Pawnee Nation's relationship with Roger Welsh, a Nebraska landowner who donated 60 acres to Pawnees who used the land for repatriation of ancestors and rematriation of corn seeds. Jacobs concludes with Hearts, where we hear the title of the book in reference to rematriation, where she writes, quote, after more than 100 winters, this corn is growing in its homeland again. In wrapping up this study on reconciliation, Jacobs asserts what reconciliation both is and is not. Reconciliation is not denial hence her catalog of details of the exact nature of what was done to Indian people in Colorado and Nebraska, but also nationally and globally. Jacobs insists that reconciliation is interconnectedness, one in which indigenous suffering and pain means settlers must come to terms with that suffering and learn what it means for them as an individual and as a citizen. So I would like to know from Professor Jacobs, if, if I'm right, is, is reconciliation, or in your view, interconnection? Or as you wrote, the, um, the, the idea that you were most inspired about is reconciliation when Native people are able to be who we are. And then I'd also like to ask you about Welsh. You talked a lot about Welsh um, and you've already sort of spoken to this before this moment about the relationship between the small and the large or the, the grassroots and the national. Um, and then I have a couple of other questions that um, really are related to my work. I just want you to talk with you about certain, you know, really specific aspects of your work. But um, this is a great, great book. And um, I appreciate all that you do and, and all of your work that you've done. So thank you very much. Thank you. Margaret? I'm not sure I remember all the questions, but I remember the first one. <laughs> And thank you so much, Liza. I, I don't think we've ever had the opportunity to meet. And I just, I really appreciate your work too. And we've been on a committee together, but we've done it all by email. So we've never met in person. So thank you. Um, so yes, at the end of the book, um, in the process of writing this, you know, I, I have done a lot of work in Australia and on Canada and New Zealand. And, um, but I was just incredibly moved by um, the words of a land rights advocate, indigenous land rights advocate in Australia, whose last, I can't pronounce his first name, but his last name is Unipingu. And um, he's a member of the Yongu uh, group in Northern Australia. And um, I'm paraphrasing him, but basically he says, you know, we native people of Australia have so much to give. We have our songs, our ceremonies. Uh, he says it so beautifully and eloquently. And he says, if only uh, the rest of Australia could recognize what we have to give and let us be who we are and walk with us into the future. And 
I thought that was so incredibly moving because he and others have so much reason to be mistrustful and angry and outraged. And instead he's, you know, holding out his hand, offering a gift and this gift of reconciliation. And um, I do think, I mean, reconciliation, I use the term truth and reconciliation because it's a globally recognized term, uh, but it is a somewhat fraught term. And so um, I think it's just so interesting when Native people, Indigenous people have the opportunity to explain and articulate what it means to them. And it's so many different things. But Yuna Pingu's vision is amazing to me. This idea that you don't need to be threatened by Indigenous people that we have gifts to bear and you don't need to see us as poor and uh, dependent or dysfunctional or full of hardship and quote plight. Um, but we have gifts to bear. And so I think that's such an important thing that I learned along the way. Um, and I'm, I'm just kind of amazed by that generosity. But the other thing that I learned from so many Pawnee people is that they see reconciliation very much in a, a kind of as reciprocity, as forming relationships. And so one person I talked to, Donna Hare, writing in, she told me that, wow, it's been great that we got some land back from Roger Welsh, but almost as important as getting the land back are the relationships we've formed and not with just with Roger Welsh and his family, but also with all the citizens of this tiny little Nebraska town called Danabrog. And um, that also spoke volumes to me about this concept in Donna's mind and many of the Pawnee people's minds that this is about building strong relationships. And, um, one objection that a lot I've heard a lot of Indigenous people talk about to the, the objection to the term reconciliation is they feel like, well, we were never conciled. We were never close. We were never, we never had a good relationship. But that's not exactly what I, I, I think that is what gets to Josh's point about the variety of experience, because I think that's very true in Colorado where I grew up. There were never good relationships. Uh, but it's not so true in Nebraska because uh, over and over I meet uh, white settlers whose ancestors had very positive relationships with the Pawnee people who were here and, and are now reestablishing those relationships. Um, so that's a very long-winded answer to Liza's question. I don't, I don't know if we want to um, go to Liza's second question, if I could remember it or we're on to some other comments. Liza, why don't you repose it uh, and, and we, can, we can entertain it. Well, it may have already been addressed, Margaret, but um, I was thinking a lot about Welsh and about the relationship of the small to the large or the grassroots to the national or the settler to the settler state, however you want to frame that. And just wondered if you had more beyond what you've already said to say about that, you know, and for people who haven't read the book, um, you know, this, this particular family develops, um, this settler family develops a relationship with Pawnee Nation, basically, mm -hmm. um, that results in them repatriating land to the nation. And then the nation uses this to repatriate ancestors. So, yes. um, yeah, so, so obviously that had a huge impact that I wanted to just give you the space to think about, you know, obviously you're contrasting that with the United States complete failure to do anything even similar to a truth and reconciliation process, or even really begin the process of having an official conversation about that. Now I'm making my question too long. I'm being a tough bucket. <laughs> uh, I wanted you to be able to speak to that. <laughs> oh, thanks again, Liza. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I realized that there's, uh, I think there's a lot of cynicism around um, some of these efforts, uh, you know, like there's a lot of cynicism around land acknowledgements, right? Because we think they're just empty gestures. They're, they're just meaningless. And I actually don't feel that way. I feel like they're a really important step and that we need symbolic action. We need words and we need deeds and we need material actions. Um, 
But I think there's some people who would read this book and they think, well, what does it really mean that Roger Welsh and his family gave 60 acres of land to the Pawnees? The Pawnees lost millions of acres. Uh, this just seems like, you know, a drop in the bucket. It's nothing. Um, and um, it made me ponder, well, what, how do we create social change? You know, how do we, what is the relationship between an individual action like this or a city like the city of Arcata, or I'm sorry, uh, city of Eureka returned an island to the, um, oh, I'm forgetting. Oh, this is awful. I can remember the island's name at the moment, uh, but I'm forgetting the name of the nation, but they returned an island to the native people in that region. Um, and so what is the relationship between these small gestures of reconciliation and the bigger structural problem? And, um, you know, I think when I started this project, I probably would have been one of in that camp of cynics about this, like, oh, it's nothing. It's, we need structural change. But, but I think that um, sometimes that can become like the basis for paralysis or not doing anything because if we're always saying well it doesn't mean anything if Roger Welsh gives back this land because there's all this other land that still remains out of the hands of indigenous peoples and hasn't been returned um, and that we need some big structural big big solution to this um, but I think those big solutions have been often disastrous and I think these smaller actions I think they start to accrue, you know, and that Roger Welsh's gesture led two other white Nebraska landowners to give land back to the Pawnees. Um, when people hear about these things, uh, for example, we did a little 11 minute film about this uh, return of land. We got lots of feedback. People asked us, how could I do this? You know, how can I return land? Or um, then people will ask, you know, well, I don't have any land. What can I do? It starts conversations. And, um, you know, like I was thinking about in Seattle, uh, where Josh is, is based, is there's a, a campaign called Real Rent Duwamish, uh, where people who don't own land can nevertheless pay money for renting the land upon which they live uh, from the Duwamish people. Um, so I actually think that the more of this kind of engaged work at this local grassroots level that we can foment, um, the more that it builds like momentum for, um, for, for expanding this or scaling it up. You know, so, so maybe things are happening a lot at the state level. They're happening in California. They're happening in Colorado. They're happening in Wisconsin. They're happening in the state of Maine. Um, and maybe, you know, that can also uh, expand and grow into a national movement. I think we need this effort at all levels of society, um, but that I hope we never lose that local aspect of it as well. Thank you very much. We're now going to open this up to those in the audience uh, who have been patiently waiting. Yes. There are a number of folks whose hands are up, uh, and I'd like to call on Carla Strand first. Carla, if you would unmute yourself, uh, you may pose a question directly. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Uh, I'm gonna. I'm not sure how to turn my camera on, but I'll just speak with you this way. Um, it, thank you all. This has been a really interesting um, conversation. I'm uh, unfortunately had to end uh, enter um, late, so apologies in advance if you have already uh, spoken to this, Dr. Jacobs. Um, I've read your previous work, by the way, Carla Strand, um, Gender and Women's Studies Librarian, coming to you from Land Grab. University of Wisconsin on Ho-Chunk Ho and uh, Potawatomi land. Um, so I've read your previous books and um, for my own research on um, the intentionality that white women um, really played uh, a roles in uh, the, the attempted genocide of Native American populations throughout time in, um, in, in what's now known as the US. And I'm, I'm enjoying the latest book haven't finished it yet, but I wonder if you could speak to how 
your historical methods or processes, your thoughts have changed or, or were informed by your, your reckoning with your own settlerhood. Because if, if I may be so bold, I wonder, it, it seems to me like that has changed over time as I've read your work. And so I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think that, you know, when I was in grad school and um, in my early career, um, I think that we historians have been trained for a long time to hold ourselves aloof from the material that we study. And I think that's actually not so true for indigenous historians. I think indigenous historians, uh, hopefully, I, I hope can feel a little bit more free to uh, bring themselves into their work and talk about their connections to the material, the personal and family connections to the material. But of course, that opens up indigenous historians and other historians who do that to, you know, uh, critique that they're not objective um, and that they're they're too close to their subject. And I've always been suspect of that concept of, you know, you you can't write objectively or if if you're too personally involved in it. I've always been suspect of it, and partly because of my background as a feminist scholar and feminists have long critiqued that uh, concept. Uh, so I think gradually as I've uh, moved on uh, from various projects, I've become more comfortable uh, inserting myself personally into my books in a, a greater way. And I think that it's really important um, as a white settler to uh, acknowledge that much as an indigenous scholar might acknowledge their own personal connection uh, to the material. I think it's important that we white settlers not like leave ourselves in this like realm of the omnipotent writing about uh, subject matters that we pretend are far uh, removed from our own lives. So um, I guess I've become more comfortable with that and um, more willing to uh, put myself out there in that way. And I actually think it's uh, something we, all of us who are settlers really need to engage with our histories in this way, to think about our own personal and family histories and how they have been built on um, the theft of land from indigenous peoples. And that again, as I mentioned earlier, that this has really benefited us and we, we largely can't see this. Uh, and so I think one of the most crucial steps that we can take is to try to unveil that, how we have benefited, how we have gained advantage from uh, these processes of settler colonialism. Thank you. Josh uh, has a follow-up uh, contribution, but if I could ask Robbie Dillon, whose hand is up to please stand by. Josh. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, Margaret, this is one of these, uh, you know, kind of set of questions that I've got uh, here to bring up. And I think this kind of picks up on right where you are heading with this. Um, on page 207, you write, settler efforts at reconciliation in brackets should always come from the initiation of Indigenous people and in partnership with them. So, I was wondering if you could discuss um, for the audience, especially those who've not read your book, um, if we see it as an effort, if we see your book as an effort at reconciliation, how do you engage with this directive? I love that question, Josh, because I, I was waiting for somebody to point out, well, isn't that, I mean, you're sort of taking this step of initiating some sort of reconciliation, and yet you're telling everybody that this has to be led by Indigenous people. So I think this uncovers one of the basic paradoxes and, and contradictions that is part of this very complex and difficult effort, um, is that uh, settlers have to sort of be willing to be open to this and um, that willing to engage and willing to put themselves in a place where that engagement can occur. So I sort of see this book in a way as 
myself putting putting myself in that position, putting myself in a position of vulnerability, um, openness, uh, willingness to listen and engage. Um, but I, I am fully aware of the kind of irony and paradox of that. Uh, so I don't want to be prescriptive at all in this book. You know, I'll say like, well, this is exactly what you need to do because that should come from relationships that white settlers and other settlers, not just white settlers, but all settlers form with indigenous peoples in meaningful ways. And it's through those relationships that um, reconciliation kind of comes out of that, grows out of that. Uh, so I guess this is, the book is in a way, it's kind of um, an invitation to say, Huh, I here I am. I'm this settler. I I want to have these conversations. I want to uh, work. I want to learn. I want to listen. I want to engage. Um, but I, I do fully realize that it's it's an irony and a paradox, and it's kind of unavoidable. Yeah, and I you know, but I would also like to point out that um, from you know my reading of it. I do see those relationships uh, shaping and informing uh, much of what you do bring to the book, you know, through your, through your professionalism as a historian. Um, so, you know, like, for example, this clearly is building on um, what I guess are, is, is now years of uh, collaboration with Poncas and Pawnees, with some of the indigenous journalists going out and um, you know gathering some of these recordings that uh, elders want to have out there and that they want to make sure that people know about, um, you know. And so I think that that's a key piece of what it is that you are accomplishing in this book. And so I, I didn't just want to point out the irony, but also to point out uh, that this does emerge from uh, some of those relationships that you have spent years. Um, helping to establish and cultivate, um, you know, and so I, you know, again, I think it speaks to the need of doing this work at a local level, um, that that's where some of these best efforts can actually be initiated. Thank you. Robbie Dillon, your hand is up. If you would unmute, you can pose a question. Go ahead. You were there. Thank Good. you. Um, yes. So um, I just have, uh, we've been talking a lot about the truth and reconciliation uh, commissions. Now, I think it's important here to recognize, and uh, my audio cut out for a bit, so I may have missed if you covered this a little bit last answer, but um, this originated in, in South Africa at the end of apartheid, this, this model of a truth and reconciliation commission. And in, in, in that session, the truth part of the equation was about getting people to come forward and admit their complicity uh, in things that everybody knew had taken place. Some people have argued, Anna Cook, for example, has argued that well, this model doesn't really apply well to the United States and Canada because in those cases, uh, most of the people that have happened partly because of uh, the historical gap, obviously going on in the current period, and, and North America, huge um, education. Really Rob, covered, isn't really covered by Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then um, uh, Dale Turner talks about how reconciliation is really for kind of uh, not always an element so, or, or ways of reconciling. So you have, for example, uh, the notion of a divorce that you mentioned, like, oh, well, we were never together. But of course. So, Robbie, you're coming in and out. And I think we've gotten part of the question. Margaret, did you get enough of that to be able to to weigh in? Where, where somebody. 
has to give up something in order for people to to reconcile. And then, of course, there's there's a third version of reconciliation, which is how you, for example, reconcile a, a checkbook. We literally just settle the accounts and say, okay, this is what is owed, and let's get uh, things balanced. So I I just think it's what we're talking about if we're talking about uh, instituting. And okay. to ensure that it's not uh, a set. So, so Robbie, we're having trouble getting you. So we're gonna gonna move to to Margaret, uh, who I hope got enough of the question <laughs> to be able to to respond to it. Uh, life in Zoom, technical problems. Yeah. So thank you, Robbie, and um, I'm glad you brought up South Africa because that is actually where I started when I actually had time to work on this book. I mean, I did start with going to the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but then I thought, well, I really want to learn about what happened in South Africa. And you're right, it's such a different model than uh, what's what's been going on in um, the US and Canada and Australia. And Part of that, as you point out, is because they had this amnesty committee as part of their Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and that was about trying to get perpetrators to come and admit to what they'd done in, in exchange for amnesty, which, you know, that has a great problem to it as well. Um, but then there were a, was another part of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa that was a place for victims and survivors to come and tell their stories as well. And that's been more the model that's been followed in Canada and Australia. Um, but I think you're really right. I mean, when the, the term reconciliation, I think in a Western sense, we've got a lot of times it has this financial metaphors you know, what was, what's owed and settling old scores. And, um, and that's one of the reasons I find that indigenous conceptions of reconciliation, no matter what they might call them, are refreshing, because they're not, they're not always, or they're rarely with these kind of financial metaphors. They're more about reciprocity, gift giving, forming relationships, um, and, and cultivating respect and um, honoring the past. And uh, so I think the more that we can do to um, articulate and learn from Indigenous people about what, how they would conceive of this process and, and what to them would bring like healing and justice, uh, what would bring reconciliation, uh, the better that that can be. And I, I do, I, one of the places I also started with this project is the work of Elazar Barkin, um, whose wonderful book, uh, The Guilt of Nations, has been really helpful to me to think about like the long trajectory of, of nations and groups of people trying to deal with these historical abuses. And he has a really long section in that book about indigenous peoples. And he mostly catalogs this as a phenomenon that started after World War II, at least in our modern sense of looking for redress, reconciliation, restorative justice. And, you know, he starts with the Nuremberg trials. Um, but I, one of the things that was interesting for me is to go back in the past and to think about like the 19th century and some of the things that were happening there, that they were, they were also trying to deal with these questions of, of how do you deal with these horrific atrocities uh, these horrific, they didn't call them that, but horrific human rights abuses. Um, and they were grappling with that at that time, but they didn't have a United Nations. They didn't have a community of scholars who lived through the Holocaust, who were trying to grapple with that immense atrocity. Um, but, but again, I no, no, no nation has really figured this out. Um, I know one of the, um, people in the audience asked about New Zealand. And uh, I did spend quite a bit of time in New Zealand uh, in, in looking at their Treaty of Waitangi Tribunal uh, for this book. And most of that material did not make it into the book. So maybe I'll do another book <laughs> that, that deals more with that. But I thought New Zealand may have come the closest to any nation uh, in dealing with 
properly with indigenous peoples and and they were the uh, nation that has developed really they don't they didn't do a national apology they have done a series of apologies from what they call the crown the federal government to iwis the the maori equivalent of what we might call tribal nations and so i thought that they have made some great strides. They have. They also have their problems, and um, they haven't done the greatest at settler engagement. Um, but um, this is. I think this is a huge issue. How do we make redress for these horrific historical abuses? And what are the ways that we can move in that direction? What are the models that we can look to? And that's really the kind of central question of the book. Thank you. Becca Young, your hand is up. Please unmute, ask a question. Becca Young. Go Sorry, ahead. I couldn't I couldn't find the unmute button. Um, first, I just wanted to say I'm a Presbyterian pastor and I uh, the Presbyterian Church, this is Presbyterian Church USA, um, has a very interesting um uh, principle now that whenever there's either a regional or national meeting, not only do they begin the meeting with an acknowledgement. Oh, I forgot to say, I'm sorry. I'm on Tutelo land to I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, anyway, they are not only to announce what land they're on, but they are to find a member of, of the local group um, in and invite them to the opening of the meeting. And what I love about that is it makes the people who are planning the meeting aware that there are people who are still here who are from the um, uh, original group on the land. So I just like that principle. So I just wanted to add that. Um, I think this ties into what you were saying about the fact small acts can make a big difference. Um, and the second, and my question actually is just, is there any, I find the word settler even almost like uh, what, too kind toward us as settlers. Is there any controversy about the use of the word set? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Of course there's controversy about the use of the word settler. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I mean, there's so many reasons for that too. Um, one of them is that indigenous people were settled here, you know, or are settled here. It's, um, I use, I mean, some people, some indigenous people do not like that term at all. They think it, it sounds so benign and peaceful. And, um, you know, I've heard people say, why not use the term invader? Um, something like that. Um, I use the term because I'm, I do want people to be really aware of settler colonialism as a concept. And it's something I go into in the intro and I, and I try to define what that is, basically a kind of colonialism in which uh, the colonizers came and stayed and uh, they took over the land and they removed indigenous people from the land and they kind of demographically overwhelmed the indigenous population. And the foremost sort of theorist about settler colonialism talks about how it's built on the logic of elimination of indigenous peoples. And you think about other forms of col colonialism, they aren't built on the logic of elimination because they're built on wanting to extract labor and resources from colonies. But in this case, because it's built on taking over land, there was this really strong impulse, very strong genocidal impulse. So I use the term settler throughout the book because I want to connect it to settler colonialism. And I realize it's a really imperfect term. Uh, there's, so many, there's so many terms that are imperfect. And um, so, but I think it helps us to think about those of us who are not indigenous. I think it helps us to see uh, that we have a particular uh, relationship with this land that is very different than an indigenous relationship and that it behooves us or it, it, it you know, forces us really to think about what is that relationship and 
what does it mean to be accountable in the situation uh, when you are not indigenous to this land and that and when you have benefited so much from land theft? Thank you. Angela Dickey, your hand is up. Please unmute. Thank you so much for this incredible um, presentation. I can't wait to read this book. Um, I'm a retired federal employee living in the D.C. area. I grew up in northwest Georgia, and my town was founded right about 10 minutes after the Cherokees were pushed uh, down the Trail of Tears, which ran through the town. Um, so um, I'm also speaking as uh, the descendant of both settlers and enslavers. Mm. Uh, and I, I hope you know that there's a huge overlap between the two groups. And I've been spending uh, my time the last few years working on the problem of uh, working with descendants of enslaved people and uh, truth telling and reconciliation uh, with um, between descendants of enslaved and enslavers. And I just want to say how brilliant your presentation has been and how everything you have said equally applies to the situation that we face with regard to the reckoning over our racial history and how we deal with those atrocities. So thanks so much. Thank you. I just want to say, Angela, I'm in awe of you. Great, great for you. Um, I'm really, I'm really glad you spoke up and I, I totally agree that I think our other major founding crime is slavery. And I think there's such intersections between settler colonialism and slavery. Um, so I'm really glad you brought that up and I'm just so happy that you're doing this really important work and thank you. So this is the moment where I get to squeeze in my <laughs> question. <laughs> and I have many questions, so I will, I will get right to it. Um, I'm wondering if you could reflect upon or kind of talk about you know, what has changed um, in Americans' understanding of the subject that you're writing about. One of the themes of the book seems to be how little we know, uh, how actively knowledge has been repressed. You talk about your own uh, upbringing and what you learned or didn't learn uh, in school. And at one point in the book, you cite Michael Ignatieff um, on the effect of, uh, to the effect of all nations depend upon forgetting. Uh, and we have been calling this abject violence Western expansion for a very long time, uh, but really what we've been celebrating as the winning of the West is really mass murder committed in order to appropriate the land. And I went back and I found the first textbook I've ever taught with back in 1988 as a copyright of 1987 in a U.S. survey. Uh, and it is blunt about the impact of Western expansion. There's no celebration here, but it's in retrospect, embarrassingly brief. So on the one hand, very strong language. On the other hand, let's now move on to Swedish immigrants, you know, on the plains. Um, has this changed or what has changed, you know, over the last several decades, A, and B, we're now in a moment in which everything is politicized. The 1619 project, you know, gets headlines and condemnation uh, from from some within the academy, but conservatives. Uh, and I can imagine at a moment in which, you know, there is no agreement at all uh, on our nationals, national history, um, our founding moment, you know, definitions of what it is to be an American, um, how you see this field developing and whether you're optimistic or pessimistic uh, about how this history will fare in this hyper-politicized time? Simple and short question. Yeah, yeah, simple questions, Eric. I'm sure I can answer them in a minute. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is that I'm a historian of the American West and indigenous peoples and settlers. And I've been doing this since, you know, grad school in 19, I started, I think in 1990, it's a long time. And, you know, when I started grad school, we were all talking about the new Western history. And it was a moment which, in which we really thought that we were going to change the narrative of American history and that we were going to stop mythologizing and we were going to, um, we were going to tell the truth, you know, tell, tell the historical truth. And 
it's been I, maybe Josh and Liza can speak to this as well, but it's it's been pretty disappointing to see that all the work that you know academic historians do in the field of the American West has had so little impact on changing that big popular narrative about the West and about the United States. And so one of the reasons I wanted to write this book is to, um, I mean, it's really aimed not so much as at an academic audience uh, as a non-academic audience. And it was really aimed to try to challenge people to question these narratives. Um, and so what has changed? Uh, I think I think what has changed is that a lot of students know something about this history. You know, I'm talking about like high school students in this particular moment. They know something about this history and they're just not satisfied anymore to, to be sort of given this whitewashed view of history. So the, I, I could illustrate this best by talking about what happened in Colorado fairly recently. Um, there was a movement to use an AP history textbook, just AP, uh, that talked pretty explicitly about what happened at Sand Creek. And the Jefferson County, which is one of the largest counties in Colorado, it's part of like Western Denver, they, the school board blew up and said, we will not allow this textbook to be used. And, um, you know, the students staged a walkout. And a lot of their teachers went on a walkout too, that this wasn't going to be taught in the high school. And this is not even taught in all the classes. It was only going to be taught in the AP history classes. So I think there's something that has changed there, that, that people know that there's more to this history and they want to learn it and they don't want to be denied this history. And of course, you know, all we ever read is in the news is about people who are angry at critical race theory and angry about, um, you know, teaching history in this way or the 1619 project. And by the way, uh, some of my colleagues here at the University of Nebraska have started a uh, a comparable project called the 1862 Project. 1862 was the Homesteading Act and the Land Grant University, the Moral Act or the Land Grab University. And so, um, so I think I'm actually more optimistic than I used to be. And it's because of learning about all these people who are hungry for the, for the historical truth and people who want to not only learn that truth, but then once they know it, they want to do something about it. Like there are people like Ang Angela who, who feel strongly that, you know, that it's not okay to know the history of slavery or the history of settler colonialism and then just retreat. It's, it's really necessary to build a movement around this. So I am actually optimistic. I just feel like we need to hear more about these efforts and the people who are leading these efforts and engaging in these efforts. And in some ways, the book is an effort to uh, showcase people who are doing that. And, in, you know, it's also an invitation to other people to do that work as well. Thank you. This has been a very engaging discussion, and I suspect we could go on for quite some time. I unfortunately have to draw this to a close, so my apologies to those of you uh, whose uh, questions are in the Q&A that we did not get to. And with that, I want to thank Margaret, Liza, Josh, and Christian uh, for this session, uh, as well as those of you uh, in our audience. Christian, final words from you, please. Thank you, Eric. Uh, please join us on December 6th when Kaylee Horn, Devin Fergus, and Scott Nelson will discuss insurance era, risk, governance, and the privatization of security in post-war America. Thanks again to Margaret, Liza, and Josh, and of course, Eric, for a really engaging, I think really moving and inspiring conversation as well. Thanks to our audience for listening, for joining in. We're adjourned. Be safe. See you next week, we hope.